Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Rose Support 2023 publication webinar. Uh, before we start, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Rajini, and I'm a project coordinator for the Inclusion and Climate Justice and Education at SOS UK, and I work on the Rose Support project. Um, for some context about the Rose Support, so the uh, term RACE is an acronym and it stands for Racial Action for the Climate Emergency and it exists to speed up diversity and inclusion to deliver on climate justice in the environmental sector. Uh, the four founding partners of the race Support are Hindu Climate Action, Nature Youth Connection and Education, South Asians for Sustainability and SOS UK. It is funded by Esme Fairburn Foundation and Synchronicity Earth. Uh, the Race Support is, a, is about um, organisations holding themselves accountable through this transparency initiative to speed up the lack of diversity and inclusion by improving their practices, policies and strategies to encourage racial diversity at every level in an organisation. The Race Support works by encouraging organisations to collect and submit their data to SOS UK annually for data analysis. SOS UK publishes this sector-wide data through yearly reports on the Race Support website. Um, so today's publication webinar will begin with a presentation of the main diversity data findings from 2023 and the staff perception survey. We will then have a panel discussion with an incredible lineup of speakers chaired by our host today, Larissa Kennedy, who is president of SOS UK and is on our board of trustees at SOS UK since 2021. Uh, Larissa is currently studying at the University of Warwick and alongside studying, she is the chair of uh, Talawa, a Black-led collective of racialized students and young people imagining the interconnected futures of Black feminism, climate justice, and liberated education. Larissa is also an editor at Shadow Mag and co-hosts the Shadow Light podcast, which discusses a number of the world's biggest global injustices, supporting those in the shadow community to move away from apathy and overwhelm into collective action and hopeful pathways forward. Um, so just a bit of housekeeping, uh, during the webinar, we ask all participants to use the Q&A function to ask any questions or add comments, and the webinar is currently being recorded. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. I will now hand over to Larissa, who will be facilitating the rest of the webinar and panel discussion. Thank you. Hello, folks. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to Rajini for that introduction. Um, so as was just said, my name is Larissa Kennedy. Uh, yes, I'm a final year student um, and also working at the Nexus of Black Feminism, Climate Justice and Education as a Practice of Freedom. Um, but yeah, most importantly today, I am the proud president of SOS UK. Um, and I'm particularly proud um, today as we mark the launch of the race report, um, because this work is a crucial tool in our toolbox. Um, um, and it's a tool that allows us to imagine otherwise. And that might sound like high expectations from data and from this report, but um, in actuality, they are high expectations of everyone here today. Um, because as part of organizations that are working on environmentalism, on climate, on sustainability, all of you in this space are reimagining futures. You are considering ways of doing things, of relationships to the land, of relationships to each other um, that don't yet exist. And you are willing them to an, into existence because you genuinely believe that there is an alternative to the path that we have been on. Um, and we know that racism has always been intertwined inherently with that path and with the climate and ecological crisis, uh, whether we're talking about industrialization and colonialism through to extractive neocolonialism and everything in between. Um, but in an extension of that, we also know that there is no climate justice without racial justice. And so our solutions need to match that energy. We need brave and bold energy uh, in facing up to the racial elements uh, of our work, of facing up to anti-racism as a crucial part of this work. And this is not about pointing fingers. It's not about placing blame. It's about actively seeking community accountability because we know that change is necessary. It's about using this data and using this knowledge as power, um, the power to propel us forward uh, in making our sector a genuinely anti-racist one. Um, so I hope that the race report, the data, the words that are going to be shared by our incredible lineup of speakers today um, are, are going to help you move forward in that work. Uh, we are we have a, a very diverse panel of panelists um, who are bringing incredible perspectives, different perspectives, um, and they're going to help us have this conversation uh, to show all of those different elements that we need uh, in order to progress, progress racial justice in environmentalism. 
So, um, you know, all that really leads me to do is some thank yous and then hand over before we get into that dialogue. Um, so I really want to thank uh, the whole team um, for pouring into this in such a beautiful way. Uh, it, the, the report itself, the, um, you know, we see the shiny the shiny outputs of it, but so much goes into uh, making it a what it is. So Francesca, Rajni, Swetha, Rachel, Meg, Manu, thank you so, so much uh, for all that you have done um, in getting us to today. Um, to our sponsors, Esme Fairburn, Synchronicity Earth, thank you so much for believing in this work too. Uh, thank you to everyone who's participating, all the folks on the call who were brave enough to say, yes, we will put our data out there um, and we will let people know so that collectively we can see what's going on in our sector. Thank you. And thank you for everyone who showed up uh, to be part of this dialogue too. Um, and of course, this is coming uh, just uh, as we, we're about to embark on Race Equality Week. Uh, so it's a perfect time for this dialogue to be happening um so also keeping that in mind throughout this conversation so yeah as i say before we get into uh some some contributions from our incredible speakers we of course need to hear uh, the research we need to hear the report itself so i'm going to hand over to our incredible head of research and impact at sos uk rachel drayson Thanks, Larissa. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk through the findings from 2023. So before we delve into the findings, though, I'm going to talk, provide a bit of an overview of how the race report works for those of you that might not be familiar um, with some of the mechanics of it. Um, so there are really two elements to the to the process. The first is the diversity data. Um, this element is an annual process that sees UK's charities, trusts found, and foundations predominantly focus on environmental, climate, nature or sustainability issues reporting on the diversity of their staff and trustees. It's designed to help us build a picture of representation across the sector through providing a standardised reporting protocol. Um, in 2023 and from now on, we'll be publishing an aggregated report as alongside some individual transparency cards for each organisation that takes part. Uh, you can find the report and the transparency cards on our website. The second element, uh, which was launched in 2023, is the staff perception survey, and we're going to be repeating that biannually. This collects data on the experiences and perceptions of people working across the environmental charity sector, and it's designed to enable us to collectively ensure that the increased diversity we might see is matched with workplaces that are fully inclusive. In both elements of the campaign, we use identity groupings to support the analysis, and these are presented here. We use these groupings solely for the purpose of analysis, and we don't mean to imply that the experiences are uniform within the groups. I won't read these through in, in detail, but please look at the report for the finer details. So first of all, I'm gonna talk through the diversity data aspect of 2023's race report in a bit more detail. So there's four stages to get to the where we're at today, where we're presenting uh, the results. Uh, firstly, organizations collect the data about their staff and on the action they are taking to progress diversity, equality, and inclusion. Secondly, those organizations submit their individual data to the race report. Those data submissions are checked and aggregated by the race report team. And then the organized data is the organization's data is published as an individual transparency card and aggregated into the main report. Uh, so I'm going to move on to now to the results from the main aggregated report. So in 2023, data submitted to the race report represents 142 charities and funders at some level, although it's worth noting that these are predominantly charities and also that not all organizations submit data against every category that we ask for. The 142 organisations represent just over 12,900 employees and are supported by around 1,100 trustees or members of governance boards. Aggregating all the data that was submitted shows that in terms of overall staff members, 6% identify as people of colour or as other ethnically minoritised identities, and that's based on data from 140 organisations. When looking at senior leadership positions, 5% of people identify in this way, and that's based on data from 124 organisations. 
Uh, and finally, 9% of trustees identify as people of colour, whereas other ethnically or minoritized identities, and that's from 115 organisations. We also collect data on a number of other, of other categories, and you can find full details of all those, uh, all that data on the website in our main report. So when we ask organisations to submit their diversity data, we also ask to report on the action they're taking to progress equality, diversity and inclusion. Uh, in 2023, these are the most commonly implemented actions uh, when you consider um, actions that are both fully and partially implemented. And uh, these are a regular review of equality, diversity and inclusion activities to make sure that they remain effective and impactful. And 86% 86 of, 86 of organisations said that was partially or fully implemented. Compulsory staff training on race, equality, diversity and inclusion is fully or partially implemented by 82% of organisations. Um, and the same percentage say that they have a race equity or diversity and inclusion strategy or something similar within the organisation. In terms of the least commonly implemented actions, again, so that's considering partial and full implementation. Um, these are holding the investors in diversity accreditation or something similar with only 7% of organisations saying that's, that's in action or in process. Um, publishing a race equity pay gap in the last 18 months with only 11% saying that this is something that they're fully or partially implementing and including improvement in racial diversity in the performance targets of managers or directors um, was only reported by 14% of organisations. Just to note that the list of actions was put together through desk research and consultation with EDI practitioners. And it's something that we'll review in future years of the campaign to make sure that it's in line with the aspirations of the sector. To track the progress uh, of the sector, we're comparing the race report diversity data in two different ways. Um, firstly, we've compared the data from organisations that have taken part in both years of the campaign. So initially when it was launched in 2022 and again this year. Um, so not all organisations have taken part in both years who, who were part of the data set this year, meaning that overall data from each year isn't comparing like with like. When we isolate the data from the organisations that have taken part for two years, um, there is no significant change in representation of people of colour or from racially or ethnically minoritized backgrounds. Um, you might say this is what you might expect given that the nature of the change that we're seeking and the fact that we're just two years into the campaign. Looking at the action on equality, diversity, and inclusion, however, most aspects measured by the complaint show small increases in implementation. In some places, those changes are statistically significant, um, and that's an encouraging sign within only two years of the campaign. The second way of comparing data um, that we're using is um, with UK-wide data. So we've extracted data from the Office of National Statistics Annual Population Survey to find equivalent figures for people across the UK population overall who are a, in working age and in employment at the time the research by ONS was carried out. The results from ONS show that 15% of people who fit this description are of non-white identities. And we just want to flag that this is the terminology used by ONS reporting rather than a term we might feel is appropriate. This compares with 6% of people from the overall staff category in the race report who identifies people of colour or from other ethnically minoritized identities in 2023. Um, this shows that there's some, still some distance to travel until the sector is reflective of the UK population. So that was the diversity data aspects. So I'm now going to talk through the second element of the campaign, which is the staff perception survey. Staff Perception Survey was introduced in 2023 as an additional opt-in element of the campaign. The data was collected through the development of and hosting of an online survey by the race report team. Uh, Organisations who'd opted into the research then promoted the survey to their staff members with everybody, no matter their background, able to take part. We didn't collect any names to help preserve anonymity and the survey was open during June and July last year. The responses were then analysed by the race report team, and after this, the organisations that took part received a bespoke report with their data. Uh, these haven't been published, they are just to help those organisations in their journeys 
uh, around equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, but the data that is published is data that's aggregated across all organisations that took part, and that's available on our website alongside the diversity data report. So in 2023, 43 organisations opted into the research, and from these organisations, we received 1,552 responses. To analyse the data I'm going to present shortly, shortly, we've created an average of the results from the organisations taking part. Uh, this helps us to account for the different contributions between the organisations uh, to the total number of responses. Uh, we've also tested the results between different identity groups that we use for statistical significance. And the rest of this presentation only focuses on those results which showed a statistically significant difference between uh, white identities and people of colour or those from other ethnically minoritized groups. So some of the key differences that we found are related to recruitment and development within organisations. For example, 81% uh, of people of colour um, agreed or strongly agreed with the statement, in my experience, recruitment process is fair at my organisation, compared to 87% of, of white identities. Responding to the statement, I feel there's as many opportunities for me to succeed in my organisation as there are for my peers. 51% uh, of people of colour agreed or strongly agreed, compared with 68% of white identities. And in relation to the statement, my organisation has paid for me to take part in training and development opportunities in the past two years. 47% of people of colour agreed, compared to 64% of white identities. Similarly, key differences were also found in perceptions related to the action and leadership shown by their organisation on racism, equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, so, for example, of responding to the statement, senior leaders routinely agree, routinely champion equality, diversity and inclusion to staff and key stakeholders. 61% of people of colour agree compared to white identities, um, where there's 72% agreement. 56% of people of colour agreed with the statement, my organisation actively identifies and opposes racism through its policies, practices and actions, compared to 68% of white identities. Likewise, we found differences in relation to belonging and identification within organisations. Um, for example, 74% of people of colour agreed that they, they feel that they belong in the organisation they work at, compared to 84% of white identities. Similarly, 41% of people of colour agree that they have to adapt to fit in with the organisational culture compared to 24% of white identities. And 66% uh, of people of colour said that it was important to them to see role models within from their ethnic or racial background um, compared to just 23% of white identities. As well as the differences I've just highlighted using that averaged approach, we also found further differences using a different method analysis. So looking at the results individually rather than applying that average uh, revealed some different results. And we've chosen to publish these as well as part of our commitment to data transparency and to fully show the experiences of the people that took part in the survey. We found differences in the following areas using this individual approach. So um, in terms of recommending working at their organisation to other people with their background and identity, 79% of people of colour agreed with that statement compared to 87% of white identities. Reflecting on the statement, I can be my whole self at work, 61% of people of colour agreed compared to white identities where there was 74% agreement. When considering their organization's action on race um, and responding using a scale of one to 10, where one was their organization is not taking any action, 10% of people of color chose between one and three compared to 5% of white identities. This individual method of analysis uh, also re revealed differences in the experience or witnessing of racist harassment, bullying or discrimination amongst different groups within the workplace. For example, when reflecting about witnessing or experiencing these behaviours amongst colleagues, 14% of people of colour um, identified with this experience compared to 6% of white identities. When reflecting on their managers, 
12% of people of color say that they witnessed or experienced uh, these behaviors um, compared to 4% of white identities. And when thinking about contractors, uh, the figure is 7% of people of color saying they've witnessed or experienced these behaviors compared to 2% of white identities. That concludes the summary of the key findings from the two elements of the race report. Um, there's a wealth of further data to explore on our website, um, including the full reports from both um, aspects of the campaign, as well as all of the transparency cards for the organizations participating in 23. Um, so we'd really encourage everyone to head there after the webinar to find out more. We really hope that you find the data useful and we would encourage any feedback or comment on the findings. Um, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to hand over back to Larissa now as we move on to hearing the reflections of the panel on the data. Uh, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So. Rachel, thank you so much for going that, through that with us, uh, for giving us a flavour of what has come up this year. Uh, and, you know, I think we've got some incredible panellists who now are going to reflect on their initial responses to those findings. Uh, and so... At the moment, I'm just going to do some introductions of those panellists uh, and then one by one, uh, I will come to them for their initial reflections. Um, so who have we got on this lineup? It's a very exciting one. Um, if we were in person, I could be hearing everyone saying woo, but just like imagine it for now. Um, so to kick us off, we have Tori Choi, who is a Bristol based climate activist, writer, speaker and consultant from Hong Kong. Tori is the debut author of her book, It's Not Just You, and organizer with Stop Rose Bank, Earth Percent, and Climate Live. Uh, so let me just give the whoo. Um, then after that, we're coming to Sai Joshua. So Sai, South, South Wales born and based, Sai has worked closely with people who experience race discrimination and utilizes lived experiences to assist larger organizations in understanding the importance of achieving race equity in the workplace. He currently works at the RSPB as a senior race equity specialist. Uh, Sai also sits on the Criminal Justice Board for Wales Independent Oversight Panel that addresses the systemic discrimination and disadvantages experienced by BME people in the criminal justice system. So thank you for being with us, Sai, as well. We also have Miss Divine, um, an environmental community engagement consultant, DJ, music artist manager, um, and multimedia radio broadcast journalist from Bristol. Big up Bristol in the building, come on. Um, I'm, and uh, Miss Divine is holistically focused on making the environmental movement more inclusive and representative of all communities that are disproportionately impacted by env environmental issues, making sure that no one is left behind. Uh, we've also got coming with us Vivs. Uh, Vivs is the founder of South Asians for Sustainability, uh, one of the founding organizations of the Race Report. She's also on the advisory board of the Race Report, where she brings a unique perspective from her lived experience and breadth of experience as a managing consultant and human rights campaigner. And then, of course, we've got Charles Ogunbode, who is the assistant professor in applied psychology at the University of Nottingham, um, whose research addresses a range of topics, including mental models of climate change risk, factors underlying motivations for pro-environmental behaviour, the effects of climate change on mental health and well-being, uh, public responses to pollution in freshwater environments. Charles, what do you not do? Um, Charles' research is often cross-cultural with uh, diversity inclusion being a key ethos of his work. Um, and he has previously investigated how UK environmental organisations engage with ethnic minority communities. Um, he recently led a landmark project investigating how people of colour experience and engage with climate change in the UK. So when I said this is a star-studded lineup, I was not lying, okay? Um, and just one by one, I'm gonna be coming to our panelists for those initial responses uh, to the findings, just a couple of minutes each. Uh, and then of course, there'll be time for questions. So as they're talking, please be mulling over what you would like to hear uh, from our panelists. Um, you've got the Q&A function here on Zoom. We wanna hear from you. We wanna get your questions in. Uh, so please do send them through as you think of them. So Tori, coming to you first, what are your thoughts on the Race Report 2.0? A? Thank you so much, Larissa. And I'm a very big fan of your work. So also very star-studded in who's facilitating this panel. Um, yeah, I, you know, I had a read of the report over the last few weeks. And I think it's super important to say that transparency is essential to making change. Um, but one thing that, you know, really stuck out to me, but 
One of those things that isn't surprising, sadly, is that the staff perception survey showed that people of color and other ethnically minoritized groups unanimously rank lower when it comes to perceived fairness, belonging and action against racism. Um, and I think all of us know these feelings all too well for those of us who have been in the environmental or like climate justice sector. None of this is news to us. Um, but at the same time, we hope that this transparency is something that can really spur on the change that's needed in the years to come. And, you know, the report also showed that there are more organizations who are engaging in diversity, equity, inclusion training for their staff. So it would be interesting to see how minoritized people feel that their work environment changes after this happens. Um, so it'd be, yeah, interesting to see that longitudinal effect that we see over the years. But this is especially important as, um, you know, if you have a look at the report, there are also a lot of people of color who have noted down microaggressions as kind of being prevalent in their organizations. Um, and many have stipulated that this isn't necessarily done out of malice, um, but rather ignorance. And so this training, I think, is essential to really addressing some of those behaviors, because I think we all desperately want this change. And there are so many allies in the environmental community who want to bring about this change as well, who may be enacting harm without realizing. But at the same time, there was this one quote which I saw in the report, which I really, really resonated with, and I'm going to read it out for you. Um, so one person said, personally, I would like to see the framing of race and ethnicity as it relates to climate work move beyond diversity and inclusion and belonging and equity and anti-oppression across the board. So I think this is um, a mindset which is really prevalent in the climate justice space. More often than not, in anti-oppression work, we're not trying to get a seat at the table, but rather dismantle the table that is oppressive in the first place. So justice needs to go beyond the paradigms of structures which are embedded in you know, colonialism and white supremacy. Um, and inclusion politics, while it is important, alone it can distract us from the bigger picture. I mean, that organisations fall prey to, like, tropes such as tokenization, which can actually reinforce racism. Um, and so I think a justice oriented lens is really important, like reparative justice, for instance, not just, you know, um, solely putting people in these organizations um, who won't fare well, but actually making sure that the structures within these organizations allow these people to thrive. So that's something that I think collectively all the organizations need to think of in the years to come. Um, and I think something for me that would be really interesting is for there to be a bigger breakdown of what organizations identify as justice oriented versus, you know, conservation and traditional environmental organizations and where the representation is coming from. Because my sort of intuition is telling me that actually we're more likely to see diversity in climate justice organizations because of that focus on the justice. So I'd be really curious to see where that breakdown lies. Um, and I also think that, you know, for the future, further reports should strengthen the intersections between class and gender and race, sexuality and disability, because as we know, these things compound people of color's, um, you know, experiences within organizations. And there are certain folks within our communities who may have more privileges than others. So we need to make sure that that's outlined. So those are my thoughts. Thank you so much. I love what you said about not getting a seat at the table, but dismantling the table. Yeah, let's get some clicks for that, some claps for that. Um, so thank you so much, Tori, for those first reflections. We're definitely coming back to you. Do not worry. Okay, so next up on my list, Sai, please take it away. Give us your initial reflections. Hey, Sunisa. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Um, like Tori, I think in terms of the overall findings, I'm not surprised. Or I don't think it would be a surprise for people of colour who have to experience the impact of this on a daily basis and show up for work. This isn't new. I'm reminded um, when I used to work for a UK charity called Race Equality First, we were all about helping organisations to be anti-racist and, and supporting people affected by race discrimination at work. And when I was there, I learned about the colour bar that used to operate in the UK before 1976, before it became illegal. And the colour bar made it OK for employers to refuse to interview you, to deal with you, to serve you as a customer or if you were a person of colour. So the colour bar wasn't law. It was informal and it operated across many sectors and made it difficult for people of colour to find and progress in employment in the UK. And there's many examples of people of colour having to change their name, deny their heritage, 
where even getting a promotion back then could result in your colleagues going on strike until that promotion was removed. And all this was legal. And this re resulted in many people of colour having to accept poor working arrangements, fixed term contracts, you can see where I'm going with this, lower wages, not being seen as leadership material, unable to raise concerns, because even if you did, your concerns wouldn't be properly investigated. And the whole idea being, look, if you don't like it, leave. So the reason I mention this is that there's echoes of this colour bar still left with us today. You can see it in the race report. You can see it in those staff survey perception findings. It persists, that underrepresentation in leadership roles, that barriers to progression, um, being given signals that we don't belong. And it's just a massive human impact to this um, on people of colour and those who witness this problematic behaviour. And when I'm looking at the data, it's so important that you've included quotes from people because we mustn't forget the people behind this data. Sometimes we can be looking at percentages, rises and falls and colours and all the rest of it. It's not to forget that there's people suffering, have been harmed behind this data. And it's important to remember that. I think the race report, from what I've seen, is such a useful tool here when I stand back and look at it because we do stand a better chance of addressing some of these issues and removing some of these barriers as a sector and focusing on those structures and seeing where certain structures are going to be changed, but also looking at those processes, those institutional processes and systems that are embedded that need to be taken away or unlocked in order for everyone to be able to thrive. So it's not just an education and awareness piece. I see it as an institutional piece. I see it as a systemic piece as well about how organizations link with each other around this issue. So um, in closing, um, it's really positive that the race report has got funding until 2027, I believe. I really do believe that this will move the dial, um, but people have kind of need to see the change now. It's been too long. And that's why it's encouraging to see that more and more organizations are coming forward to this. Thank you so much, Sai. Si. And yes, shout out. That's why I mixed up the two words. Thank you, Sai. And shout out to the to the five-year funding. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. Um, but also what you were saying about the color bar being it. So I feel like that was a bit of a mic drop moment on, you know, that analysis of where we were and where we still are in these spaces. So thank you for that and really links to what Tori was saying, I think, about the connection between class and race. So I'm sure we'll get into that in the dialogue in a second. So thank you so much. Um, and next, I am coming to Miss Divine um, for that initial reflection. Uh, our DJ is having a little technical difficulty for a second, I think. We can't hear you right now, Miss Divine. Yes, there we go. Sorry, I, I munched my screen and I couldn't find my um, mute button. Uh, thank you so much uh, and good morning to everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so this race report, woo, absolutely necessary. Um, this race report, for me, my reflections, uh, definitely, uh, the, the fact that we have this race report is testament that people have observed a discrepancy and uh, a shortfall. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm just overjoyed that resources have been directed towards uh, the equality within this sector um, because regardless of how you know we got into this environmental quandary it is going to take everybody um, out of it. Um, one of the things that I, I always go on about is communication is absolutely necessary uh, because uh, you know of obviously the state of this, se this sector um, but the report for me shows that more more can be done, more needs to be done to quell the the quote unquote gatekeeping within the sector and the soft racism within the sector. Um, because uh, you know, I've been in the, the environmental part of the environmental movement since maybe 2021. So I'm kind of and from the gate, from the jump, uh, my colleagues and I both noticed the stress um, so yes, it's all about sharing resources because under the umbrella, under the, the, the environmental umbrella, we have banking, we have housing, we have, we have, you know, land justice and, you know, we all know that land is power, food, fashion, animals, plants. Um, so, you know, we have a, a big environmental uh, family. Um, but yes, uh, this report shows the lived reality of 
a lot of brown and black people in this sector. And uh, most of our thoughts, feelings are generally, you know, they generally have to be suppressed as we are told to, you know, just get on with things and stop dwelling on things. And there is a lot of gaslighting within this sector. Um, and I know this is uncomfortable for a lot of us to have packed, but, you know, this is why, you know, uh, uh, communication is necessary and, and us congregating together today um, is absolutely necessary because uh, this report has given, um, given us a voice and, you know, a lot of us do feel heard. And uh, to uh, uh, piggyback or, or veggie back for the vegans out there and veggies, vegetarians, uh, um, some, something that um, Sai uh, Joshua said um, about, you know, more funding. It's, it's, it's amazing that we have funding and up until 2027. 20, uh, but yes, we definitely um, need more funding um, to kind of quell, make, uh, make things, um, you know, make things, um, as equal as possible. I, I, I am going to wrap up now, but yes, it's going to take everybody. And I will uh, say that it's going to take Ujima, which means collective work and responsibilities. The Swahili is one of the sacred Kwanzaa principles. And it's a Swahili um, word, collective work and responsibility, because regardless of how we got into this situation, it's going to take everybody um, working to get together collectively um, to get us out of it. And another thing, last point, we have to understand, everybody needs to understand that different cultures and different ethnic groups, we, we celebrate and we deal with grief and we deal with, you know, we celebrate in different ways and we learn in different ways as well. And that has to be uh, applied. Um, and I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miss Divine. And I'm so glad that Kwanzaa Principles made it in here. Um, because al this almost feels like a form of a uh, Kuji Chugalia, you know, like self-determination, like being able to talk yeah. about having our own voice, that kind of thing. So thank you for dropping that in. I wasn't even connecting it in that way. So I really appreciate uh, you bringing that into the discussion. Um, so next up, we're going to Vivs, one of our co-founders come through. Thanks, Larissa. Um, pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, it's been so amazing to hear everyone's reflections. Um, I think uh, I went into the depth of some of the findings um, prior to, to the call as well. And there were there's key themes, which everyone has already mentioned that have come through. Um, but one that really stood out to me in terms of my lived experience and as you know, in consultancy within the sustainability space as well, is the retention and progression points. And you can see this through the data, despite being we're on our second year of the race report. Despite this, you can see clear themes. So um, in retention um, of of uh, people of color within this space, um, you know, only 5% are retained in this. And that links directly again, 5% um, with progression of people of color. Um, so there is this direct correlation we're seeing in terms of the opportunities that are given. Um, to, to add to that one, when, when people were questioned in the staff perception about training and development, um, you know, majority of people of color um, had to fit, felt they had to adapt to, to fit into their organizational culture. That's 40, 41% people of color um, uh, compared to 24% of Caucasian employees and colleagues. Um, and again, uh, one that really stood out to me from the staff perception survey, which we introduced this year was, um, organizations have paid for training and development opportunities. Again, there's a huge disparity between what's seen in terms of funding for that um, progression and, and opportunity to grow. Um, so those are like key things, I, I guess, from my initial reflections on some of the data that's come through this year. And I'm so excited to see how this is going to continue to be built on. Um, you know, it's clear we can't, this is so early still in the journey, and there's going to be way more that we get to see in the years years to come with this data um so yeah it's just it's a pleasure to see and be a part of but a part of this movement and and change forward um and just finally i guess seeing it in the industry as well we're seeing social sustainability on the rise whether it's through ifrs standards with employee experience on the up um wildlife countryside link for example two of their key policies that was launched this year on on 2030 was about creating more green jobs but also the human right to clean air water and access to nature and this is all interlinked so to see it come together on this 
broader platform um, and to see the data as well will only shift it will shift us forward and, and keep propelling us so yeah um, I guess that's my reflections at this point and um, uh, looking forward to the questions as well. Absolutely thank you so much Vivs and what you're saying about the necessity of uh, thinking about retention and progression that is the pipeline that's what builds our future in this space so 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 important and thank you for bringing us back to those key stats um, and giving us that broader outlook too and then last but definitely not least Charles or in fact let me put some respect on your name Dr Charles come let's hear your initial reflections please Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. It was fantastic to read through the report. In a lot of ways, it feels like um, a dream come through. A dream is like you've written to Santa and said, I like this for Christmas, and then bam, this report is produced. Because for such a long time, we've had all these conversations about what's going on and the experiences of people of colour in the environment sector. You know, it's like you're talking to another person of colour and you're like, yeah, 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 I understand what you mean. I know that experience. You can totally relate to it. But there's no there, there's no data. There's nothing to really point to and say, look, that is what I mean. And the race report really totally plugs that. So for me, reading the report, it felt like jumping off from a quite po a positive point. I think um, it's a really key resource uh, that's there. It really establishes this norm of being transparent, you know, transparency around these issues um, and also having sort of a, a point of a very strong point of reference that we can kind of keep coming back to to kind of see how we're developing, what prog where progress is being made or not, uh, that sort of thing. I think overall, if I'm honest, I, as someone who works with data a lot, um, I feel like um, I'm not really sure how much I can read into the areas where we had significant differences and things like that. I think it's really early days. Um, with this report, you know, a few more down the line, we'll be able to see where we're at. But nonetheless, I felt like some of the main themes for me were quite positive. You know, four and five people of colour in this 2023 survey would recommend their places of work to other people of colour. To me, I felt like that is a big positive. That's not really the idea of the environmental sector that I had in my head, you know, maybe three, four years ago. So the fact that we're there, I think that's a good thing. That's something to be celebrated. Of course, there's still a lot of ground to cover. There's still a lot that we need to do um, to, you know, really get to where we need to be. But that I think those are things that we need to highlight as well. You know, two out of three people say they can be their whole selves at work. I mean, I was expecting a lot worse than that. So, you know, I thought that was really good and it's really worth sort of highlighting that as well. And also linked to that is the fact that, um, you know, I really commend the organisations who've been brave enough to step forward, open up, be transparent, really put their... For want, you know, for want of a better word, money where the mouth is, you know, really stand by what they've claimed they're going to do to enable this happen. So I think that's a really good thing. Um, a few, a lot of the points that I thought about, um, I've already been covered by some of the speakers. So I won't go over those again. But two main things that kind of came to mind were one, it would have been good to see some more disaggregation of the data on climate justice organizations compared with nature and environmental organizations. I think Tori covered that really nicely when she started out. I feel those organizations can be really quite different in the way they operate and just their general guiding kind of philosophies and uh, strategies which means that, to my mind, climate justice organizations are probably more likely to be diverse anyway, and lumping them in with the rest of the environment sector, I think, might skew the overall picture somewhat. Um, and then a uh, second point was, I kind of missed, I really wanted to hear about the experience of volunteers. This sector heavily depends on volunteers. And that's where a whole lot of stuff, unsavory stuff happens. And I would have liked to see more explicit focus on the experiences of people of color who volunteer in environmental organizations and for environmental initiatives in general. I mean, obviously we've got, you know, I'm really happy to hear about the extended funding. We've got a lot of time, you know, to really um, kind of build on the current work. And those are the sorts of things where I think it'd be nice to see uh, more, um, um, to see more progress on but i'll leave it there for now and um i look forward to the questions again i'm really excited about this thank you so much thank you because even i saw everyone nodding when you said volunteers there it's so so important that's something to think about for sure um i also think it's important what you said about it being early days and we've got so much time to keep building on this data to make sure that we know exactly what it is that we need to know um to keep growing from strength to strength um, so thank you for that feels like community energy in here already um before we even get to the questions so thank you for bringing that um so soon um so to kick us off in terms of the questions and for folks who are uh, participating in the webinar please remember that you can submit questions unless you want it to just be me asking all my personal questions um 
But my my question, first of all, uh, taking chair's privilege uh, to ask you folks is, you know, a lot of you have spoken about the need for structural and institutional change, uh, change not just uh, that's going to be at the kind of tweaks at the edges, but really getting to the root of what our issues are here. So for organizations who may be at the beginnings of this journey, what are the pitfalls that you would guard against uh, when it comes to taking on this work, taking on, you know, anti-racism seriously uh, at the structural and institutional level? And I've got to pick one of you first, so please don't hear me, but Sai, it feels like um, you're a great person to come to first on this, if you don't mind. Okay, I think the thing that just when alarm bells went off in my head about the things to really think that you need to get, and that is you have to ensure that you are speaking to people of colour within your organisation. Co-production, co-design on anything you're choosing to do is absolutely fundamental to change. And quite often we see organisations go tearing off in one direction and not actually paying any mind to how people of colour are actually feeling in the organisation. And I've seen this happen in other organizations where they've put they've gone all in on, for example, on recruitment and are not recognizing that you need to deal with retention and belonging and progression first. Or, or it needs to have equity or even more resources gone into that area. And um, because I think that a lot of organizations see, oh, well, I can measure recruitment really easily. So let's start there. But and, and progression is a bit more difficult. But ultimately, if you're dealing with that area of belonging, about culture, what you'll find is by proxy, your people will stay. And by proxy, the recruitment level will go up. It's one of those things that I've seen as, a, as an experience. So and, and part of that belonging piece is, is that you need to be talking to people of colour and involving them in analyse and involving them in solutions and not as a tokenistic gesture, gesture, something that is very meaningful. There's a value exchange going on and, and people need to be rewarded for that value exchange too. So that would be my thing, my first thing. Yeah, rewarded that there at the end. Remuneration, people. Yes, yeah, so a co-production, but making sure that that is valued um, and rewarded. Uh, I think that's so important. Thank you. And you mentioned uh, retention and belonging as really core cool parts of that. Um, Vibs, of course, you, you brought that up in your reflections from the survey. Do you have any further thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think especially if we look even more broadly beyond environment sector, um, when we think of DNI generally, and especially for women of colour, there's actually stats to back this up year on year that uh, me people have much more success in progressing if they leave a company than staying on and and that's across the board, but even more pronounced in our sector. Um, so it if that if we know that that is the foundation, that's the basis, what can we do, whether it's um, mentorship programs or internally the actual access to training and development, as I mentioned, or just policies that are in place for recruitment. So that came up in, in some of the data as well about um, who is actually in that recruitment process, who is speaking to colleagues in, in a business and an organization right now, how, how is that being acted on? Um, in Introducing those practices and policies to the best level is really gonna, as um, Sai mentioned, create a stronger foundation to prevent people from leaving and enhance belonging because just having that diversity tick doesn't necessarily mean an inclusive culture. Um, so yeah, that, that I'd add to, to what I said amazingly already. Thank you for that, Vibs. Um, definitely taking us further on that journey. Um, who else wants to jump in on this one and you know further reflect on that kind of broader piece, that structural piece? Yes, Mr. Vine, please do take it away. Hey, can I be heard? Nice one. Um, I, I just want to mention um, something that Charles said uh, uh, when, when he spoke and that uh, the race report is a resource. Yeah. And that's something that we can all, everybody on, on the panel, everybody um, in the background, everyone who is on, on the, this, this webinar can, can really um, solidify in their mind that this is now an actual uh, a resource. So thank you for articulating that, Charles. And, 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 and as you said, Charles, it can be used for reference. Um, so yeah, there, there, there's, so, there, so there's no, there's no um, um, excuse uh, moving forward. But what I would like to say is that, you know, 
people are far more likely to receive information from people that look like them as well. So, you know, this, you know, we're all sitting down, we're having these conversations um, right now. Um, you know, so many people have said, you know, amazing things uh, like um, you, say, you said, uh, you know, you're talking about resources um, and and uh, Charles as well. And like people actually, people who have, because I like to see, I like to say that, you know, people say, oh, privilege. But it's, it, if you have, it's people who have the resources, have the power. So that is the privilege for me. So anyone who has that privilege of wielding the resources, um, you know, and they've successfully cracked the code because there are a lot of organizations out here who have um, successfully, you know, relinquished power resources um, and, and stood back and, and, and uh, you know, given their platforms um, to give, uh, you know, black and brown people globally a voice. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's about sharing resources and communication. And I'll shush. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Charles, please do jump in. I don't even need to come. <laughs> Sorry about that. I just uh, basically I was coming to a point about this, and Mr. Vine has linked that in very nicely about this idea of relinquishing power. Um, and um, again, going back to the race report, there are a lot of references to things that happen within organizations about sense of belonging and all that. And I was also kind of reflecting on that. And incidentally, as soon as Tori mentioned this quote, because that really jumped out at me about this, you know, rethinking DEI and maybe expanding the conception a little bit beyond what's happening in the report right now, um, to really think, you know, does it really end at inclusion? Because you can have a, a sector that is inclusive and diverse without it necessarily being anti-racist or anti-oppression. Uh, you know, can we do a bit more in our reimagining of the sector? Um, and I was thinking one key thing that would be nice to come across is how much people of color feel they're able to steer the direction in which their organization is going in terms of strategies and policy and operations. Because um, I feel one of the barriers to at an institutional structural level is there's always been this perception of diversity as a sort of threat to doing things the way we've always done them. And I feel like, you know, really making the, the sector uh, dive, uh, 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 a safe place, you know, uh, an appealing and attractive place for people of color to come to and stay means relinquishing that a little bit and kind of letting people, you know, just trusting people to take the evolution of the sector into it because it has to happen into whatever direction uh, it goes to. And I think that really ties into this. So this is an example of that we're investing in the resources that will make that happen. But I hope that we also um, really begin to see that in terms of the policies that have been enacted within organizations to really allow that to happen, really allow that to take place. Thank you for that, Charles. So a couple of themes here around power and relinquishing power. Um, Tori, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this kind of structural piece. What are the things we want to avoid or lean into? Or Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. In fact, some folks have already kind of raised them in the Q&A of just this, uh, what sometimes feels like this inevitable burden where you do burden black and brown people with this um, responsibility to lead the change. And I think first and foremost, these people need to be resourced whether that means emotionally and financially, because this is extremely uh, debilitating and exhausting work for people to take the charge. Um, you know, if you're going to bring in somebody external, that obviously relieves some of that pressure. But if you are kind of someone within your organization who is spearheading the change, I would encourage, you know, um, white folks within organizations to recognize the burdens that that comes with and to actually support these people. Um, there's another thought that I was kind of having, and I think this is something that I've been thinking about a lot recently with everything that's happening in Palestine. Um, a lot of organizations actually try to stifle the political views of um, people of color within their organizations who are trying to push for, you know, um, beyond representation to push for justice, to push for anti-oppression. And we really need to have that sort of political literacy to understand that it's not just about the diversity and inclusion. It's also about making sure that our organizations reflect the values um, of justice. And, you know, I've I've spoken to some friends and, and colleagues and, and folks who are in different environmental organizations expressing sheer frustration about the fact that they are being silenced 
um, for these political views, um, to, you know, be told that they shouldn't get politics involved, that it's, it has no place in the workplace. But it's like, what are we fighting for at the end of the day if we're not allowed to talk about these things that are inherently shaping our world and shaping the liberation of our people as well? Um, and so I think that, you know, organisations need to be more proactive in taking a stand um, in, in what's happening around the world which is undoubtedly affecting us as well. Um, and so, yeah, those two thoughts, making sure that the labor doesn't fall on people of color without them being resourced and supported, and also making sure that organizations can play a bigger role in shaping not only society as you know we know it, but globally. Um, so yeah, I think that's important to make sure that people are free to speak politically. Absolutely, and thank you for bringing that orientation towards justice into play in this dialogue because I think it's so so important it's something people are experiencing in live time um, and just to pick up on your point previously um, about that burden there's actually a question coming through uh, to the panel about um, the idea of co-creation with black and brown communities and individuals uh, and this person sorry I can't see who it is um, has said um, as a brown person I don't always want to be the one who comes up with the solutions this leaves me with the question um, as an EDI officer in my org, how can we work uh, with black and brown communities without placing a potential weight or burden on them or us? Um, any examples of how you've worked or currently work with regards to this? Um, so yeah, maybe just jumping from uh, the, the concept of co-creation, but then how do we practically make sure that that's not kind of burdensome? Does anyone have examples of where um, that's been kind of core to their work? Um, I know you're all doing loads on this, so maybe you've just put the burden on yourselves. Hopefully not. Um, please, self-care and all that, please. Um, but who who wants to jump in on that one? Um, I'm thinking maybe Vibs, but how are you feeling about that? Yeah, I can start. Um, I think one thing that's been popping up and Tori clicks as as you were talking, honestly, so much of what you said resonated. Um, but from a, a practical perspective, things I've seen in the industry, it starts with literacy of senior leadership, um, fundamentally, like to to avoid that burden being placed on and I've died this is from coming from personal experience where I've been told straight like if you want to be passionate about DNI or if you do feel passionate about DNI and you want this change like it's always been that burden is on me necessarily like it feels like a burden but equally a passion and I feel it's that it, it, you have to find a balance I feel and keep that boundary but to really propel and project change in organizations it has to I feel with this trickle from the top and genuinely not tokenistic it has to be senior leaders are on board with why it's important and sometimes that might be business cases put forward and it might be that you have to show numbers this is just from my I guess what I've seen work and not work to show okay this is the loss of an organ to an organization of not having an inclusive culture that stands for this justice that um, you know allows employees and, and colleagues to progress um, and when that's put on the table in numbers suddenly like people so I've seen some senior leaders completely change not just because of the finances but actually because it makes sense to do this and it can be a light bulb moment when it is presented in a different way and, and talked about in that way and cultural change will take time it's not it's not perfect it's not an ideal world and I think that understanding of imperfection along the journey and getting to a point and you know us all working collectively will take us to that area that we're we're really working towards um but yeah I I hear that the burden is there and it it's not something I feel will change overnight um but I think it starts with that senior leadership from from a practical perspective um anyhow but I'm excited to hear from others as well on this. Okay, so senior leadership and also thinking about the words that we use, the language that we're using, the points that we're using um, to drive things home. Um, such great interventions there. Anyone else have those kind of practical thoughts uh, on what can happen? Another kind of connected um, example coming through from Sai. Thank you. Yeah, I was to, to build upon what Vince was saying. That leadership buy-in creates the environment of change. And without that, it's a struggle. You'll it's, you'll be moving against the current. So you know what you need to do, as as Vip has laid out, is that you need to get that leadership buy-in from leaders within your organisation. 
Um, I wanted to pick up on that that burden because it is for, for those that are participating in the race report, it can feel like a burden for those individuals that are there at the front line collecting the data and presenting that data internally to people as well. As as, as and there's a pressure when it goes externally, when it's gonna be transparent and and and, and stuff, because then it is it's a hot potato, this topic. Do you know what I mean? So it can play. So a lot of yeah, yeah, the see risk of iron nodding. And it, 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 you know, it's it, it it can be a quite a challenge for people of colour within the organization to be able to deal with that. And and so it really does need, you know, people to to, to be able to support those individuals in terms of uh, being able to make the case and and sort of share the labour a, a little bit has been really, really important. I wanted to come just briefly to the, the partnership element of like working with communities. And this is where I, I see organisations don't do that well. And um, and I think um, what is they see where organisations get it wrong, what I've seen is that they look at the relationship as a transactional agreement. Um, they don't necessarily see the 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 that they're just them being involved can be a burden on a small community organization. And and I think it, it's always to, in terms of if, if if the partnership has to be mutual, there has to be a mutual benefit. And so if or, an organization, if you're looking to approach um, um black and ethnic minority communities and community organizations you really got to think about that carefully and not only think about it as, as a terms of a, tr a transaction or they're going to make us look good it's it's more of like how is this going to change the organization how is this going to help affect our culture and think not transactional think transformational don't think short term think long term in relation to dealing with organizations think in three to five years instead of a summer and i think that's what we really need to see if we want to engage uh, in co communities in relation to this transformational not transactional i'm taking that one away i might have been still that one sorry si um <laughs> that was i think that was a really good way to think about it um and we can all take that away for sure um it's also quite connected to a, a similar question that's about how that you in terms of that burden how do you protect um folks from harm in the work because i feel like it's not only um staff within organizations folks working within these organizations but also the folks externally in those community organizations that you're talking about Sai. i'm struggling to find the question in this second i'm so sorry um but someone did speak about uh how do you ensure that like folks are almost protected from harm. Um, there we go, there it is. How do you best engage with people of color within your organization while protecting them from harm and not expecting staff to feel like it's their job to help fix the issues within the org? So yeah, I feel like all of these things um, are you know, intertwined. But Ms. Devine, did you have um, some further thoughts on that? Yes, thank you so much. Um, yeah, what is it very, I mean, me personally, I, I was you know, shocked when, you know, coming into this sector and I was like, oh God, facing resistance. I was like, oh no, not here as well. It's exhausting. It really is. Um, but you know, because because we're all support we're all in 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 it for the for the same reasons, excuse me. <clears throat> and, and it's to save the, the environment and the planet. Um, so um, something that uh, Tori mentioned, uh, she uh, said about uh, being monetarily resourced, and that's so important because sometimes you know people feel time is money to a certain degree. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, but many people, myself included, uh, have you know suffered from burnout in this sector because it is like a black hole you keep feeding it and feeding it and you just keep taking it taking from you um but yeah down to this is down to communication again as a solution um and understanding that you know we have to be mindful as i think um some of our panelists have said uh, of the language used as well because quite often in this sector a lot of legalese is used uh, the language of doctors and lawyers and it doesn't mean that some people who don't understand that quote but language that they're, they're stupid it's just they, they have not you know that's just not their reality um so yeah it's, it's being very mindful about mental health and i think that mental health definitely within the sector it needs to uh be top uh, uh, on the top uh, as a top priority to make sure that you know we're looking out and looking after you know us a family the green family our green family, yeah. 
Thank you for that, Mr. Vine. That's so important. Um, and I think, Tori, maybe it makes sense to come to, to you next on this about the connection between this work and mental health. Um, you, of course, were on the Shadow podcast talking about eco-anxiety and all of that, but um, just have this broader perspective on, on, on the connection, yeah, between mental health and environmentalism. Yeah, for sure. Um, I actually kind of want to leave you with this panel that I did uh, last year. It was at Wild Screen Festival. For those who don't know, it's like a wildlife filmmaking festival and I kind of popped off a lot on the panel um because I was quite frustrated you know um I kind of moved to Bristol initially to be in that industry and I I left very quickly because I just realized it wasn't accommodating for my values and like it wasn't very diverse um and many of my friends have also had these experiences and one of the things that I'd kind of said and the whole panel was on eco-anxiety and it was like done in a very Eurocentric way it was like talking about some of the threats that um you know the climate crisis poses and like how can we support the mental health of our um you know our employees who are dealing with eco anxiety and i i found it a little bit um don't get me wrong it's a very big issue but there was absolutely no intersectionality that was embedded in that messaging and like for many people of color climate change might not necessarily be seen as the first existential threat. And that's obviously a very unique and personal thing. And for me, it was a little bit, for lack of a better word, like tone deaf, because there are so many people within the wildlife filmmaking industry who struggle so profoundly with their mental health as a result of racism in there. But when it comes to talking about eco-anxiety, which is a very real thing, and we know it affects people of color as well, um, it was just really interesting that because it is seen as this thing that can affect a lot of white people's mental health, we're going to center that discussion. Uh, and I think that far too often when it comes to thinking about mental health and the burdens that are placed on people of color, it's not really adopted through this intersectional lens, like understanding the many existential threats, the many systems of oppression that are affecting people's mental health as a whole. And so I'd encourage organizations who want to care about the well-being of their employees, like really think about it through this intersectional perspective, like really understand the many struggles that people are enduring. Um, no one size fits all. And yeah, I just wanted to leave you with that panel because it was just the first time that I'd heard that that particular industry wanted to care about people's mental health and I'm like you literally have employees in your organization who are struggling so much because of the racism but that's never been addressed so you can't address mental health equity for all unless you address what's happening to those who are most marginalized like nobody is free until everyone's free like that needs to be really understood at a fundamental level when people of color in your organization thrive you will also thrive like they're yeah, their well-being benefits everybody. Yes, and I feel like those kind of things are said as sayings, but that is the actual practical reality of it. So thank you so much for bringing us to that. Um, unless anyone else wants to jump in on this question, I really do want to... Charles, were you about to jump in? Um, but if not, I really, I would love to centre this this question that's come in. Okay, um, yeah, I was, I, I had a comment oh, on no, one no, of no. I thought there are probably other questions, so I'll just wait and hear the next ones, because I do want to hear the other questions as well. I'll add a quickly... Sorry, to... sorry. No, <laughs> I, just, I saw this one, and maybe it's me seeing a personal connection with it, but um, this uh, attendee has said, I am still a student and the youngest person at my organisation. I'm also the only Black woman, and I'm passionate about making sure that DEI is not tokenistic, but I feel as though I'm not in a position to tell senior leadership what to do. Does anyone have any tips for how I create change? Um, I know you've done lots of research on this work, Charles. So I don't know if you want to kick us off with a response to that one. Thanks. Yeah, I think it, it does tie in back very nicely to some of the points that Sai and Ms. Devine and Tori, everyone at Vibs have, have made earlier as well. And I think you're almost always going to be in that position where you're in the minority or you're the only person you're in the uh, organization. You're trying to sort of get some action around this um, issue. And um, in my uh, uh, more recent work, I've found that overall, it's kind of important to acknowledge the sort of diversity of visions and diversity of um, 
positions along the journey that people, different people might be within your organization. I think sometimes, and this is common to environmental issues broadly, it's common to issues around race and equity as well. These problems are big problems. They're issues that people have very strong convictions about. Um, and yeah, we need to spend a bit more time just having those dialogues and negotiating our positions and not coming to it an absolute kind of, you know, expectation about how things are supposed to happen. I think that's one pretty important way to start off if you actually want to make progress um, is just uh, 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 accepting there's going to be some negotiation and some compromise involved at the start. And then the second thing, a uh, principle that I found quite interesting as well is this idea of kind of stepping back and kind of seeing where your um, the, the issues about inclusion, um, even if they're not necessarily a priority for the people that you're speaking with, trying to identify those points of connections where you can get them to buy into it. Because as Sai says, if the people who have the power, if people in leadership positions don't buy in, it's not really going to go anywhere. And one um, um, idea that I found really useful was this idea of radical inclusion, which came from reading um, David um, Senge, is the education minister for Sierra Leone. He's written this book of radical inclusion. And his work has been around kind of keeping um, girls, girls who get pregnant very young in school. And his idea is basically, look, this isn't, obviously it's about the, keeping those girls in school, but it's not just about them. It's about our system as a whole. Our system is only as good as it caters to the most marginalized, the most disadvantaged in the society. If it's not really providing for those people, it's probably not a very good system to begin with. And I found that also very useful when thinking about race and inclusion and thinking, look, as an institution, as an organization, as a business, as a movement, whatever you are, it's not really, a, it's not just about racial inclusion, it's about our standards, our values overall. Is this really the best we can do? And being able to kind of connect with those big values sometimes helps to move away from those flash, those difficult, you know, conflict points because we can always come back to this common values, common goals, common interests that we share and use that to kind of propel things forward um, on race and inclusion as well. Thank you so much for that, Charles. Um, and definitely is possible. Mr. Vine, I see you clicking there. Did you have anything else to add on that piece and um, any advice for our young sis who, um, uh, just if you want me to come back to the question, but who was uh, talking about? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, like, t yeah, team build. I mean, who, 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 like she's asking who can she turn to in real time? Like, what can she do? Like, she's stuck between a rock and a hard place. Um, and, uh, you know, if she's not able to speak to her quote unquote superiors or her boss about it, and like, uh, like, uh, team building exercises are always, you know, kind of, uh, you know, a good resource to to connect people i keep going back to communication as a solution um so uh, the the only advice i could give you is to not stay silent and you know just you know respectfully uh, air your grievances and, and let people know how you're feeling so there's re their receipts you know there's a there's a paper trail to to you know you, you actually spoke out and you know if if nothing is done about it you can say well look i i you know there, there are receipts. I mean, yeah, be vocal. That's that's all I can say, really. Just talk up, speak up. Definitely do not suffer in silence with that one. Um, did anyone else want to jump in on that? Yes, Sai, please do. Oh, sorry, Vibs, I think you also did, so I'll come to you. <laughs> oh, good. Um, I just, I, I also resonate with this because I remember in my very first role, I came in as a really fiery, passionate activist um, in a large kind of corporate organization. Um, and I, I felt very similar. I definitely had that feeling of, um, you know, imposter syndrome, how much can I actually do? Um, and what can I say? Where is it my place to say, especially if there's a hierarchical structure and kind of within the organization as a culture. Um, I found finding communities within the organization um, who also feel similarly gave me that support to be able to take it forward as a, you know, a flag or something, even if it's not that anything you've experienced particularly has happened, but you really want to see that change coming in numbers within that and showing that other employees care about it just as much as you then allows for steps to take place much quicker rather than you feeling alone and then not having that support either. Um, so that was just something that I, I thought I could, I could add to, to the question. Definitely. And I saw a big thumbs up from Sai there when you said finding community. Um, is that what you were also thinking to say, Sai? It's the, that's the big one. I think, you know, when you're, 
people are playing the center the first isolated. It, it, it have to find ways of connecting with others. Um, and that might be other people of color if you can find them, but also, you know, in terms of allies as well. I wanted to do a shameless plug too, because the the wildlife and countryside link have got a peer support group that also looks at strategy and learning as well as supporting each other around some of the barriers and hurdles that we face on a day to day basis. It's called the Ravens. It's run by a person called Nadia. And if you're feeling isolated, perhaps we can send the details out to those who are involved in environment and conservation to see if they want to come to that group. Because I know that I've, I attend that and it's, I know it's been helpful for members to be able to share those experiences. Amazing. So a plug there that might be able to help. Um, Tori, yeah. So you yeah, okay. uh, like community is really like the key word in all of this. And I think that... Um, if you can't find community in your workplace, and I know it's such a huge privilege to be in and out of different workplaces and it's not easy to say, oh, this isn't serving me and just leave. Like we know that's a huge privilege. And sometimes we have to weigh up these decisions when it comes to like our well-being, um, if a place is really not good for us. But I'd also encourage finding community outside of the workplace to resource mm -hmm. you and support you. I think community organizing, for instance, has been really empowering for a lot of people that I know and reaffirms the values that you have and know that you're not crazy for thinking these things like this should be the bare minimum you know like be around people who support your values who support the things that you care about um because ultimately that's going to bring you in the in in the right direction for where you want to go and you know will resource you to be able to deal with these things adequately or otherwise you know if you have the liberty of leaving a place that just doesn't fulfill you, like you have that community to fall back on who can also like recommend other places where they know are supportive. Um, something that, you know, a lot of us do in our sort of discussions, like with my friends and I, who are people of color, we're always saying, is this a safe place to work? Like, can you vet this place for me? Can you say like, is this an inclusive space? Like we have these conversations because it's necessary. You know, it's so necessary to know whether they take our concerns seriously. Um, so yeah, community outside of the workplace is also really important. I was really hoping you were going to say that because I think drawing power from the outside, like sometimes, I don't know, maybe not for everyone. Sometimes I just need to get to a protest. Remember, remember what energy is going to be feeding me and go back in and say, okay, breathe, we can do this. Um, so I hope some of those tips about building community on the inside, building community on the outside and that plug there from Sai, I hope those few things um, can help the person that sent in that question. We also had a question from earlier, uh, which was reflecting on Charles's point about volunteers um, and asking uh, and said from their experience uh, of mostly white organizations and uh, very little motivation to change, you know, the setup is pale and stale. So how do we change that uh, in terms of volunteers um, and who who is in those spaces? Charles, I don't know if you want to, it was, it was directed to you, so I don't know if you want to jump in. Uh, yes, I mean, my point really was more about just kind of keeping an eye on what's going on with volunteering. I don't have any super creative ideas about what to do about volunteering, but I know that it's, it's, it's a, a segment that needs a lot of attention, um, just because in general, it tends to be less resourced. Um, um, and um, sometimes you have situations where volunteers are operating almost out of um, control of the regular. So you can bring in DI policies, you can bring in all sorts of stuff to regulate what happens within an organization, but sometimes volunteers just kind of fall within the cracks. So a lot of those, um, you know, really bad experiences are happening to volunteers, but they're not really being addressed by the organizational policies. And that's why I think it's really important to look at that. And actually a similar um, um, group that comes up in the risk report is also contractors. So you have lots of um, policies around the behavior and the, you know, that just govern the staff within organizations. But sometimes you have co contractors falling between the gaps and there's a lot, whole lot going on there and we're not really having much oversight on that. So it's really good to keep an eye on that. I think when volunteers ultimately, it still comes down to some of the things that we've discussed already about resourcing. We need to put resources into the people who work with volunteers, the way the volunteer systems are set up and um, to make sure that people are adequately kind of, um, there's an adequate safeguarding against um, so this racially motivated negative experiences that people might have. 
Thank you for that. Uh, Vibs, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just had a few things that I've seen work really well uh, in terms of like what came up in the data as well about mentorship, um, mentorship schemes and, you know, reaching out to local communities, even if it's from a corporate social responsibility perspective or even volunteer days, kind of building that community partnership. Um, from an organization and these, uh, you know, the incredible volunteers who may be volunteering because they just love it, or they might be trying to, I, I've spoken to so many people who use that as an avenue to actually get into this space and to be able to utilize that experience on their CVs and, and for professional career progression. So where, where are we bridging those opportunities to have that access? And it, it all comes back down to, again, another thing that came up in the report about how many organizations are reaching those diverse, um, whether it's ethnic diversity, racial diversity, or beyond to get those people into these organizations. I feel looking at voluntary organizations and NGOs and, and you know people who might be doing all sorts of conservation work um, will then uh, uh, expand that talent pool as well to be able to, to bring in more, more groups into organizations. Absolutely. Um, I'm just so sorry. I'm seeing that I'm running to time. I was just enjoying all your answers. I was just there listening and I got carried away and now we don't have a lot of time and we've got loads of questions. But I think I want to land uh, with one last question, unless people had burning thoughts on the volunteers um, and broader peas there. Um, because I, this person um, has been working in this space for four decades. The person that sent in this question said, over 40 years of work in this field, we see lots of nice words and social media, but no structural change, particularly in leadership. Is the sector, in brackets, white leadership? I love that you said what you needed to say, whoever this wrote in, um, uh, on leadership, um, not willing to give up power. We need radical change. What does the panel think? So if we could just have a quick fire, like one minute answer from each of you uh, to kind of bring this panel to a close, that would be amazing. Um, so we need radical, radical change. What does the panel think? Charles, it looks like you're ready to kick us off. Yes, uh, thank you so much. So just quick uh, response, looking at the report as well, the other thought I had initially was how it's kind of a narrow definition of what the sector is, and if it was possible to re reorientate the focus. So it's about environment and less about environmental organisations, because environmental organisations aren't the only players in the sector. So we've got, especially with people of colour, knowing one that people of colour don't have as much of a distinction often between environmental issues and other broader social political issues that are relevant to our lives. We've got loads of people operating in that space addressing, tackling environmental issues, but not necessarily identifying as environmentalists or being in environmental organizations particularly. So one avenue to really begin to drive that change is also to begin to recognize and allow more of that to come in to what we traditionally define as the environment sector as well. I think that will begin to really, um, yeah, just shift, just shift the concentration of power with the traditional structures. Um, I think there's, a, there's definitely a lot of potential there shifting power absolutely love that thank you charles coming to Cy next yeah i agree with everything that charles said and and i would like to add to it that there's so few people of color in the sector um so and we've got the data now so things like the race report right so we can start to use positive actions that are set out within the equality act 2010 to start to address this i would like to see you know a leadership program um, maybe a cluster of environmental organisations or those in the sector uh, where you get, as a person of colour, get opportunity to shadow leaders, to have a de career development programme, get enhanced training on how to deal with trustees or strategic development. I'd like to see that approach. It, it's been working, it's been working uh, in across in the USA, across the pond, in uh, especially in academia and universities where they've had this approach to developing ethnic minority leaders. I think it's something that we should look at as an environmental sector as well. Thank you, Sai. Mr. Vine, are you cool to go next? 
Yes. Um, yeah, so uh, I will just, the uh, repetition is the mother of learning. So I did mention this earlier on, um, and that is speaking with people who have already successfully cracked the code. Uh, myself, I know organisations within Bristol and beyond who um, have implemented uh, inclusivity in the right way. And I'm sure I'm not the only one on this panel. Um, so, you know, I think it's about get, getting them all on board and seeing, looking at their blueprint and seeing their, their framework and what they done uh, to kind of uh, make sure that there is a uh, you know kind of equality within the sector thank you so much we'll keep repeating it until it happens um and vivs are you called to go next yeah for sure um i think allyship has become up constantly in in this and that keeps coming up when regardless of level of seniority within organizations I think it's building allies across the board and utilizing that to bring about the change um I think that is fundamental from my perspective um particularly with senior leaders um but across organizations to see that and then secondly again reiterating what I briefly mentioned at the start um utilizing what standards we that are now coming up I think what the difference between 40 years ago and now is that we actually there's actual things in place like the new IFRS S1 standards that's all about employee experience and that's in legislation it's in regulations that can be utilized actually as a way to bring about further change quicker because we have to now like there's no there's no going, you know, forward without you looking at that. Um, so utilizing that, I know IEMA also is setting up a social sustainability steering group. Um, all of these things and mechanisms that are in place now, utilizing them as much as possible to to as a I guess a springboard to if you need to speak to senior leaders to build that allyship, you can always utilize what's a necessity now, which Ne wasn't necessarily before the case um so yeah that's it but it's been it's been amazing thank you so much um to everyone for the questions and speakers for such amazing insights thank you Vivs. um and to close us out tori any final reflections yeah thank you um i think being proactive and being uncomfortable is essential to doing this work um i think that you know a lot of people will be saying seeing how we can do this work in the workplace, but I'd also encourage you to take the work outside of the workplace. Um, so whether that means like reading books, there are so many incredible anti-racist resources written by specialists in this area, like Me and White Supremacy by Leila Afsad is a great starting point for a lot of people. Um, and also doing any proactive anti-racism courses. My friend Jess Malley um, runs them, um, they're on her website, Jess and then space M-A-L-L-Y if you're interested. I did answer someone's question, but yeah, for anyone who's interested in that, that's also great. Um, and just coming back to the discomfort, I think far too often when we talk about people of color and white people, and this is kind of touching on a question that I saw in the Q&A box, um, a lot of people will say that it's divisive, that it's separatist, um, but you have to understand that we're actually trying to work off the foundations of an ideology which has routinely separated and dehumanized people of color. And in order to address that, we have to start understanding why the separation has come about and address it through these lenses, which sees that people of color are being disproportionately impacted. And we have to also address, and I'm speaking, you know, from the perspective of someone who might be white, um, address the sort of discomfort that comes with understanding why these structures exist and why we need to lean into the discomfort, to lean into this thing that maybe to us feels kind of alienating and and separatist and, you know, divisive. Um, and only then can we really start to see the change that we want to see. Uh, and I think discomfort is so essential to growth. I'm routinely discomfort, uh, like go, go through discomfort. I think it's really important as activists, as change makers to embrace um, that discomfort and to be accountable. And I, I get stuff wrong all the time, like, I'm constantly learning and growing and I would yeah encourage those who are listening to to say it's okay to make mistakes and like we can learn and grow through that so discomfort is key love 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 that so thank you so much to all the panelists for your reflections today we're taking so much away from all of your thoughts your um, wisdom on finding community on the need for resources and remuneration and allyship 
that transformational, not transactional relationships with community organizations and so much more. Um, and so just thank you so much for your time and for your wisdom. And all that leaves for me to do right now is hand over to Manu for the closing piece here. Thank you so much, Larissa. Uh, incredible chairing. The questions were insightful and incisive, and I'm feeling really inspired by every one of our panelists. Uh, we feel really, really honored that you could take part in this in this webinar. It uh, was a properly star-studded lineup, and uh, so much for us to take away, so much for the race report to learn as we move forward into the next 12 months uh, about how we can collect the data better, how to use it, how to engage organizations, communities, and people as we move forward. Uh, up next for us is getting back to the, to the grindstone and getting ready for this year's uh, race report. We'll be hopefully launching the data collection in April, so look out for that. Please do sign up to our newsletter. We've got a great set of resources that we're putting together so that we are able to help organizations even further and events coming up through that as well. And we'll be announcing those in due course. I think um, I'm inspired by the wonderful words of Audre Lorde, uh, who said, I'm not free and while any woman is unfree, even when her shackles are very different from mine. I think we've heard a lot from the panelists here that the issues of justice and equity are interconnected and they intersect. We live in a complex world and it requires a lot of working together for us to start to break down some of the structures that have been put up to, to oppress those people who are marginalized. So uh, with that, I'd love to thank those people who are making this work possible. Esme Fairburn for their continued funding, which we've got for another five years, as we've heard. Synchronicity Earth, who also provide financial support to the project. The project wouldn't happen. Uh, we wouldn't be able to have the great team, Fran, Rajneet, Meg, Swetha, Rachel, uh, all the people that have put in so much hard work into this, collecting the data, analyzing it, making sure that it makes sense to the public, making sure that organizations are engaged. Um, I wanna thank them and then those organizations who have uh, stuck their head out and taken part and been able to look at transparency as a tool, not as a, uh, a shackle. Uh, we want to thank you for your for your for your input. Um, transparency and accountability are are key to all of this. So please continue to support the race report. Encourage your colleagues. Encourage other organisations in the sector to take part in this coming year. And uh, that's all from us. And thank you to everyone who took part. Uh, in this webinar today and for all your questions, please get in touch uh, with us here at SOS if you would like to know more, if you'd like to follow any of our panelists today or engage in other ways. Thank you and have a good week ahead. It's Race Equality Week, so please engage with everything else going on. <laughs>